Welcome to Dateline, everyone. I'm Lester Holt. A teenager in a small town, a terrible killing on a summer's night. It's a case that some thought might never be solved, even though somebody was already in prison. Then there were the whispers, those whispers that never stopped, that the suspect locked away was somehow an innocent man, that the real killer or killers had walked free. That's what drew us to this case and drove us to uncover some long buried secrets. Here's Keith Morrison. Up in the northeast corner of Montana, hours and hours by car from the big rustic ranches of the famously wealthy, is the winding Missouri of Lewis and Clark and a small forgotten town which once carried the stain of an unenviable reputation. Poplar is the name of the place. A generation ago so frequently soaked in the blood of violent death, it was known as Stab City. This is the story of the most vexing then and now of any of them. The mystery of a lifetime, whose remarkable turns and twists are still at this very moment posing some troubling questions about American justice. Here is where it happened. 1979, summer was here, school was out, the party was on. Kim Nee's 17 school valedictorian, National Honor Society graduate, was celebrating. He was finally about to escape this town for college. Back then, Kim's sister Pam was just 14. She always had to take me with her, and that was the way it is, you know. But around midnight, June 15, 1979, Kim was restless, wanted out, and this time without her little sister. Just coming to get the truck. Didn't say what she was doing, didn't say where she was going. And she took off. Mm -hmm. The scene is burned into her memory, as is the face of her father in the morning, less than eight hours later. He carried me upstairs, sat me next to my mom, and said something terrible has really hap has happened. He said, Kimmy's dead. And I just... You going numb? It still sometimes isn't there, you know? It's like, I can't believe this. At 7 a.m., at a well-known party spot, just half a mile outside town, police had found the family pickup, abandoned. Officers followed a trail of blood from the truck down a rutted dirt track 250 feet or so to the Poplar River. And there they found the battered body of Kim Knees. The term I have used is overkill. Dean Malam was an undersheriff and later the county sheriff in charge of the murder investigation. There were 20 or 21 blows received to Kim's skull, which any of could have caused her, her death. There was rage involved. It was a high, high level of rage. Someone was very angry. We drove an old truck, same year, different color, to the last place Kim was seen, 12.45 a.m., a gas station. Then, to the crime scene itself, where that night there was no shortage of evidence. Blood everywhere inside the cab of the pickup. Fingerprints, more than two dozen. Footprints in and around the trail where Kim's body was dragged to the river. And on the truck near the passenger door, a palm print in what appeared to be blood. The FBI prepared a report. The bloody palm print, it said, would have to have been left by the unsub, that's FBI lingo, unknown subject, the murderer. We worked very, 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 very hard at determining whose that was. And obviously we had a very vested interest in talking to that person. In addition, a sweep through town had turned up what the FBI called an extremely bloody towel on a fence in town less than a mile from the crime scene. A lab report linked two hairs on the towel to Kim Knees and said the hair evidence suggests a possible connection between the towel and the murder. Was the blood on the towel ever tested? I believe it was sent to the Montana State Lab. It was not Kim's blood that was on the towel. Did the blood then belong to her killer? Kim's cash and credit cards were still in her purse. This was not a robbery, nor was there any indication of sexual assault. So the lack of apparent motive in the murder of a pretty 17-year-old girl led many people to wonder if perhaps the standard crime scene scenarios did not apply. In fact, rumors were already around town. This was not a man who committed the murder, or a woman even, but a group of girls, Kim's contemporaries. Their supposed motive? 
jealousy. Kim was attractive, she was successful, she was class valedictorian, boys loved her, and she was about to leave Poplar behind for good. There were stories around town that this may have been some kind of killing involving some local girls. That was one of the, again, if you will, the theories that folks around town had is that there may have been three or four um, of Kim's peers that were involved with, with her death. Bobby Clincher heard the talk. She lived down the block from the Nees family. What did you hear? Her grandfather had told me, well, they're looking at the girls. All indications are that it was girls. Lists of suspects' names appeared in FBI documents. Those girls, and Kim's boyfriend also, other teens. But all of them were cleared when their prints didn't match those found at the scene. I felt bad for her parents. Bobby Clincher's connection to the Nees family was more than neighborly. Her son, Barry, had even dated Kim's sister, Pam. Like many kids in town, Barry had been listed as a suspect in the documents, too. As the mystery deepened, mothers and fathers questioned their own children, wondering if there was some code of silence they could crack. Did you question him harshly about it? Or? Mm -hmm. He said repeatedly he didn't know anything about it. The only thing he knew was what he had heard, what he'd been told. And as the investigation stalled, the Nice family took it upon themselves to try to solve Kim's killing, writing heart-rending letters to the local paper. Your dad tried very hard, and your family, your whole family, tried hard to get people to help. Yeah, we put a $10,000 reward out. And asking, begging for help. Mm-hmm. How did the community respond? They didn't. At all? Not really. It seemed like they didn't care. Summer passed, and fall, and winter. More names surfaced, more fingerprints were compared, more dead ends. But... Did you ever kind of give up on the idea that you'd figure it out? No, never. There was no doubt in my mind that we would solve this, this homicide. And the sheriff's patience would be rewarded. But the answers he was sure he would get would wait for years and come from a place he would never have suspected.